I want to read this morning this passage. What an odd passage, honestly. Father God, Mother Hen. Um, I, I talk often about how I plan the preaching calendar based on the lectionary because it holds me accountable. It holds me accountable to passages I would otherwise not spend much time with. And this might be one of them this morning, and quite honestly, I didn't know what to do with the passage. I worked all week banging my head against the wall. Uh, poor Bobby was wondering, how are we gonna close the service? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, no rush. And I said, well, there's a rush because Sunday's coming. Um, and we've got to figure this out. And I, I, I don't think I texted him my closing until Friday because I just didn't know. Um, and to be honest, I'm still not sure. But uh, there's something for us in this passage. And uh, so I want to read it to you. Luke chapter 13. I want to begin reading with verse 31. In, over these next few weeks, we began last week and we'll see this. Over these next few weeks, we're going to follow Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to Calvary. And so here we are. Jesus is standing on the outskirts of the city, outskirts of Jerusalem. And here's what it says. Verse 31, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. This is one of those rare instances where the Pharisees are the good guys in the story. They're warning Jesus, hey, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And then like kind of a lament, we hear these words. He cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me pray again this morning. God, this is your word. Do not allow this vehicle, this vessel of your word to profane what you have said. So by your spirit and the miracle of translation, take what you have said and impart it into our culture in such a way that it becomes relevant for who we are and our life of faith in you. This is why we're here, not just information, but for transformation. So we give it to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So here we are. We see Jesus standing at the outskirts of town. The Pharisees come to warn him about Herod. Now, the audience of Jesus' day would have understood who Herod was. We may not. When we tell the story of Jesus, the name Herod is synonymous with the telling. It begins all the way at his birth, even though it was a different Herod. We know the story. Uh, Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem, a little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. We know the story. He was born in, the, in Bethlehem and, uh, and, and some wise men from the east, magi, um, they, they had made this pilgrimage because they saw this star in the far east. They were astrologers and they saw this star and, and, and whatever this star was or was meant to be, they saw it as a star that heralded the birth of a king in Israel. So they came, they took a long journey, they came and they sought this king who was, in their words, born king of the Jews. And when they came to this area, the, this region, they went to, as was customary when dignitaries come to town, they went to those who were in charge. Take me to your leader, they said. 
and uh, they didn't come out of a flying saucer. That would have made the story so much better. Um, but I'm not allowed to change scripture. Um, but uh, they, went to, they went to Herod, who was reigning at the time, and they said, we've come to pay homage to this one born king of the Jews. And Herod says, well, tell me more about this king of the Jews, because Herod considered himself the king of the Jews, even though he served at the pleasure of the Roman emperor. And, and, and you know the story, they, they told him what they had seen and, and Herod gathers the scholars around him who begin to open up the scriptures and the prophets and, and they say, yeah, it's going to be in Bethlehem and all of this stuff and, and the Magi go on their way and Herod decides, uh, figures out what the time frame of this birth was and decides he's going to kill all of the babies at a certain age, two years old and younger in that area just to make sure that this air quote king of the Jews did not threaten his throne. You see, here's what I want you to get out of that story is Herod's reign was a reign of terror. Not just that he was a fear monger, that he reigned by, by uh, imposing fear on the people around him. He reigned under the weight of fear himself. He was always afraid somebody was going to rob him of his power. He was so afraid he was willing to kill babies. He was so afraid he was willing to kill wives. Hmm. Not quite as many as Henry VIII. Um, but he, and he was so afraid he was willing to kill his own kids. That's how his story goes. He was a tyrant. Now history calls him Herod the Great. And they don't mean that he was a great man. They meant he was a great builder. He was a tremendous architect. And, and to this day, some of Herod's constructions um, are littered around uh, the, the Judean uh, countryside. He, he built a palace, uh, uh, the Herodian palace, a, a very famous palace. Um, he reconstructed in all of its opulence the temple and the temple mount. Um, this was kind of his opus and, uh, and he was known for docks in Caesarea Philippi and Roman baths throughout uh, this area. He was a builder. So history has called him, uh, called him Herod the Great, but he was a despicable human being. Here's how despicable of a human being he was. He was so afraid when he died that no one would mourn his death that as he was growing ill, and it was a very debilitating disease. History has not identified what it was. Um, but as he was growing ill, he had dignitaries and, and the who's who of the region arrested, the men in particular, um, arrested and paraded into the city of Jericho where they were incarcerated so that on the day that Herod died, he would have all of these dignitaries executed so that Israel would mourn. He was so afraid no one would mourn his passing that that was the plan. Um, Josephus, Flavius Josephus records some of that and thankfully the executioners did not carry out his orders. But this was the fear that this Herod operated under. And the Herod of this story, the son of that Herod, was no less fearful. The power that this Herod in our story today had received was far less than the Herod of Jesus' birth because when Herod died, uh, the, his reign was, it was split up between his three sons and a daughter and each of them, except for the daughter, each of them in turn bore the name Herod. So Herod stopped in a sense being a name and started being a title. The way we would say president, not to refer to a particular person, but the office. And so now there is Herod in Jesus's, in Jesus's day and the people that would have heard this, the people that Luke was writing this gospel to would have known. We were talking about two different Herods, but it's amazing these two different Herods still operated in almost exactly the same way. Fear dominated their life, fear of losing control. One of the more infamous stories of this Herod, Herod Antipas, was, was the story of John the Baptizer, one of Jesus' relatives. 
you remember the story? Uh, John the baptizer spoke out because uh, Herod um, thought it was a good idea to, to hook up with his, uh, what was it, sister-in-law? Something like that. And, uh, and John the Baptist uh, called him out on it and uh, didn't like it, so had him arrested. And if you recall the story, there was an execution, uh, a beheading at the behest of the stepdaughter, but it was Herod that carried it out. All of this was fear. John was preaching a message that threatened Herod's power, threatened his his integrity, such as it was, threatened his throne. And so he had him arrested and executed. That's just one story. This is the heritage of the Herods. The heritage of the Herods is fear. It's fear. And so we come to this story and understanding this, the Pharisees come and say, Herod wants to kill you in a sense, just like they killed your cousin. We know he'll live up to the threats. And Jesus, in a sense, says, I've got more work to do. It's going to take me into Jerusalem. You tell that fox where he can find me. <laughs> That's what he's telling him. He says, I've got work to do. And, and, and so you tell that fox. Now, why did he call him a fox? It wasn't because he was incredibly good looking. <laughs> He called him a fox because fox were, foxes were considered vermin in the first century world. Even the way the Bible talks about them in Song of Solomon, they are spoilers of the vineyards. Um, they were the first after a, a, a devastation, after a battle. And they didn't come in like apex predators where they were stalking and killing. They came in like scavengers. Um, and, and they were generally seen in the first century world as vermin and a nuisance and to be dispatched with. And uh, one of the commentators I, wrote, I read, um, uh, Barclay, a, a fairly famous New Testament commentator, said that, that the, the ancient Jews considered the, the foxes sly, right? Trick, tricksters considered them vermin. And whenever fox was applied to someone else, was speaking of an impish man, fox. Now, here comes the Pharisees, and they say to Jesus, now, Herod wants to kill you. And this Herod had referred to himself as a lion. That was his designated title, title, Herod the Lion. Probably knowing he was part Jewish, probably knowing Israel's scriptures and the scriptures that anticipated the Messiah um, that, that was called the Lion of Judah. I wonder if he was, a, he was giving himself that title as the Lion of Judah. I'm the Savior. And, and hanging on to this power and anyone that would threaten it. So here comes this, this Herod and, and the Pharisees come and they say he's going to kill you and he's done it before. Um, you should be afraid of this. Uh, Jesus turns around and doesn't say, refer to him as a lion, doesn't refer to him as, as, uh, as some other great beast, an eagle or something else. He refers to him as a fox, knowing fully well that this was a sub, uh, not so subtle Slam. <laughs> and you tell that fox where he can find me. Isn't it weird? Herod, who operates under fear, does not cause any fear in Christ. Now, if I were Jesus and I was responding to this situation, I would say something like, well, you tell that fox where he can find me, and when he finds me there, what he's going to find is a lion. Or what he's going to find is an eagle who can easily carry away a fox. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says when he finds me there, what he's going to find is a hen. <laughs> a hen who longs to gather her chicks under her wings. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if you know this, but foxes and hens typically don't go together well. Right? They're, not, they're not just friendly with each other. 
You know, I, I've got I've got an, an old red hen who kind of rules the roost, and my uh, my dog comes out and comes right up to the fence and barks and carries on at her. The other birds all run away. That one red hen charges the dog. It's the funniest thing, and that dog will yelp and run away. Right, uh, so I've seen some of what a mother hen looks like, um, but in this instance, this mother hen motif that Jesus is giving us is one that is meant for us to see the difference between a fox and a hen. He says, I'm going in like a hen gathering her chicks, not like a hen gathering fox cubs or wolf cubs or anything else, but the hen that knows her own, going in to gather her own. He says, I, I long to gather you, and still he says, but you still have a choice in this. You've rejected that even though this is my heart's desire, but here's how I'm going into Jerusalem. It's not a, a, it's not a hen going, it's not a fox going into the hen house in a sense. It's the hen going into the fox house. Or we might say the fox's den. Even the foxes have dens, the Son of Man said. But where does the Son of Man, the Son of Man lay his head? Like a hen going into a fox's den. It's interesting, in just a few chapters, Luke chapter 19, Jesus, as he enters Jerusalem, marches right to the Temple Mount. Solomon, or Herod's greatest work, marches right to the Temple Mount. He goes into uh, the court of the nations, the court of the Gentiles, where money changers were there, uh, where you could buy sacrifices, and the money changers were extorting the people that came in. They were taking advantage of the poor. Here was the elite, the religious elite, taking advantage of the poor for, they were profiteering at the expense of the underprivileged, and Jesus came, came in and begin, begins throwing over tables and says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but listen, but you have made it a den of thieves. Isn't that interesting? Here comes the hen into the fox's den. And this is how Jesus is setting up his move into Jerusalem. So what does this have to do with us? Well, here's what we know. Hens and foxes do not go together. Blood will be shed. That's the story. Blood will be shed. But there's something behind this story that we need to hone in on, this fear motif, right? In the Herod's fear. Um, and so they made themselves bigger. They puffed themselves up. They made themselves lions and, and, and great beasts. And even though Jesus dismissed it, you know, kind of shrugged it off. They made themselves bigger. They were, they were fearful, so they became fear mongers. And, and so there's this fear undergirding it. And then Jesus shows up like a mother hen who has every right to be afraid of the fox or the lion or the whatever. But he's not afraid. This idea of fear undergirds the whole story. And I wonder how much fear ruins our lives like foxes, little foxes in the vineyard, little Herods running rampant in our life. Um, you see, this image, uh, this concept of Herods as power-mongering fear creators in our life is not foreign to us. We recognize Herods throughout the world. Those people or those governments that continually make power grabs are nothing more than terrified little foxes who are afraid of losing what little control they have. They are the Putins and the Stalins and the Hitlers and the Pol Pots. And in case you missed that, yes, I put, I put Putin in the same list with Hitler and, and Pol Pot. Um, they are those kinds of people. Uh, they are presidents who seek office for the sake of political leverage and upcoming book deals. They are the pastors who pursue the pulpit so that they can promote their own sacred authority, all the while serving their own vanity rather than the kingdom of God. They are the abusers who are so emasculated by their own fear that they must impose their fear upon everyone around them. You see, anytime power is sought for the sake of power itself, we find ourselves in the presence of Herod and we find ourselves subject to fear. 
every time. The Herods of our life can even be a little more subtle, um, sneaky like foxes. They can sneak into our life. Uh, they can be those things that dominate our thought, our thought lives or even our spiritual lives, those little foxes that spoil the vineyard of our life, the fear of maybe a diagnosis, the fear of failure, the fear of disappointment, the fear of what might happen. It could be the fear of irrelevance or inconsequence. That's my own personal preoccupation. Like, my life's not going to matter. I got to get busy and do something. It's fear. These little foxes that come in and spoil us and, and give us this preoccupied disposition of fearfulness. Um, and I kind of like that word, preoccupied. It means that we are occupied with something before it's even proven to be a problem. <laughs> Preoccupied. And it's military language, occupied. Just like Russia is seeking to occupy Ukraine. Just like Rome occupied Israel. These things sneak in and they occupy our lives like a military invasion. Invasion. And fear is their motif. Fear is what drives them. It's the fox-like Herods that show up in our lives anytime we find ourselves overly preoccupied by the what-ifs and the what-might-bes. It's, it's these little Herods that come into our life and breed fear. Because that's what Herods do. They are afraid, and so they make everyone around them afraid. Fear mongers, just so you know, by and large, are the most fearful people on the planet. And, uh, and, and so this we find, uh, so we recognize this title, Herod, even though we may not know the names, Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, Herod the whatever, we may not know the name, we know the rule they've had in our lives. We recognize the Herod's. So, so the issue isn't then how do we get rid of fear? This is where I was banging my head all week long. I, I thought the message needed to be how to overcome fear. Hmm. I don't know. I think I'm the least qualified to preach that sermon. How to overcome fear. Fear, And it dawned on me as I was thinking about that on the dead end of where I thought the sermon was supposed to go, uh, as I was thinking about it, it dawned on me that we need a caution when we talk about fear because not all fear is bad. Right? We can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Fear properly understood is not in itself a bad thing. Fear protects us. It does. Uh, it, we say things like, don't get too near the edge of the cliff lest you fall. So our body has a fear of heights. I remember going and fumigating uh, uh, grain silos with my dad years and years ago. And uh, the hatch that would be halfway down the silo, there's supposed to be a ladder that runs down there. Um, but, uh, but where we lived and farmed, <laughs> I guess we couldn't afford ladders. Um, so he worked with his brother often. And I remember once when I was on the job with them, I was on the ground. They were up there. My dad's older, or my dad's younger brother, Denny, uh, was at the point of the silo hanging on to something while he held on to one of my dad's legs while my dad was opening the hatch and dropping in whatever into that, uh, into that silo. All the while, the two of them, like a couple of idiots, were laughing. They were going to die through laughter. And my dad was singing the, a song heaven is just to fall away. <laughs> you see, fearlessness is usually not a good thing. It usually results in stupidity. So this isn't a message on how to overcome fear, or how to be fearless, because we need that. It's healthy. Instead, we're talking about the way that fear controls our life. And how do you respond to that? How do you maintain the healthy view of fear as well as not allowing it to overcome your life? And I, oh, I was going through the scriptures. I was going through books. I was Googling it, how to overcome fear. And all of it came up so short until I realized, I read the passage earlier from 1 John, that we don't need to conquer fear. We need a greater love because perfect love casts out all fear. 
The issue is not how do we get rid of fear. The issue is how do we cultivate a greater love? And so really, that's what this message is about. Yes, fear undergirds it. Foxes and chickens don't go together. And it's there, and that animosity is there. Um, but, but there is something greater, because the image of the mother hen that Christ gives us is one of longing and love. Deep desire, sacrificial, knowing that foxes eat hens. And knowing that we're chicks. You're like, Pastor, did you just call, you, did you just call me a chick? <laughs> but think how helpless a chick is in a fox's den. We're helpless. And Jesus says, so I'm going to be a hen. You're a chick, I'll be a hen. And I'm going to go after you. You see, this is love. And it's sacrificial love. It's love that puts itself on the line. So love is not just this warm sentiment of nostalgic love, the way that we love the Christmas season or, or the red hot um, love of eros in the Greek, erotic love, or even the kind of love that is just okay with everybody and everything, indulgent love. That's not actually love at all. That's laziness. Um, uh, But love, uh, love properly understood, love understood from scripture is an action of the body that then our hearts and our minds follow. God commands us to love. Understand this, God doesn't command us to feel something. You can't be commanded. Well, you need to feel happy, right? I command you, feel happy. You ever done that with your kids? Apologize, be sorry. Like, no, no, I can't make you, I can't command you, I can command you to apologize, but I can't command you to be sorry. God can command us to love because love is not first what we feel, though the feeling is important. He commands us to love because it's what we do. This is what I mean by cultivating a greater love. It it has its place in action, not just in sentiment. We've got to begin with love in action and sentiment will follow. Sometimes not always, but most of the time. And this is the perfect love that casts out all fear. It's a love that is so great in comparison to my fear that it's as if the fear itself is irrelevant. So let me give you an illustration of this. I have no intrinsic desire to be shot with a gun. (laughs) Right, anybody? No? Good, good. Okay, Um, I don't like walk around afraid I'm gonna get shot. I maybe, maybe I should think about that more often because every time I turn on the news and something's happened, the first thing they say is I never thought it could happen to me. But I'll be honest with you, while I don't like the idea of getting shot, and you could even say I have a fear of getting shot, it's not a fear that dominates my life, it's an illustration. So let the illustration be what it is, don't read too much into it. So let's say I have a fear of getting shot. And one night, I hear noise in my house, and I go upstairs behind my wife. (laughs) And... And there's an intruder, right? Um, and, and while she's dealing with the intruder, I go up and yell at the kids like, who left the door unlocked? <laughs> but, uh, um, right, no, if there's an intruder and the intruder starts waving around a gun and threatening us, well, I have a fear of getting shot, but I have a greater love for my family. And that love overrides that fear. You see, we need a greater Love. We don't need less fear. We need greater love. Um, I think of that teacher in the horrible shooting in Sandy Hook several years ago, elementary, that teacher who covered her students with her body and died doing it. She had a greater love. You see, where fear dominates our life, where little Herods run in like little foxes threatening to devour us, it's not that we need to get rid of the foxes, it's that we need a greater love to to disabuse them of any thought that they can make me less than what I am in Christ. So so the, the question then is how do we cultivate love? 
in our lives. Not how do we get rid of fear, how do we cultivate love? I wanna look at this quickly in three parts. Here's the first one, confession. What does confession have to do with love? Confession is the act of naming the foxes in our life. <laughs> We've gotta name them. Because what you do not see, you cannot change. What you will not acknowledge will be with you forever. This is what confession does. Uh, it's, it's like Jesus calling Herod out for what he was, an impish fox, a spoiler of the vine, a fearful and weak little man. We too confess those tendencies in ourselves. What we do not confess, we cannot change. Confession is the act of fessing up to those moments when we have looked more like the fox than like the hen. Um, more like fear than like love, more like the kingdom of the world than the kingdom of heaven. Confession is the act of recognizing that I'm a chick in the fox's den, incapable of escaping the devastation of prowling foxes. Uh, like Rich Mullins once sang, maybe we need to be reminded that we are not as strong as we think we are. Little chickens in the fox's den. We need to confess that. This is what sin has done. And it's not just, we think confession is just about confessing our sins. And well, we Nazarenes, you know, we're saved, sanctified, petrified. We don't need to confess our sins. Like I've done responsive readings here where there's acts of confession. We confess to you, O Lord. And I've listened and I've watched some of you go like, I'm not praying that. I'm not praying that. No, we've gotten it all wrong. Confessing is about recognizing the little foxes that come into our life. I don't care how sanctified you are, foxes are, will come in and ruin the vineyard. Amen. And we need to confess. It is a habit, and it's a habit of love because unless we confess that, we will continue to be trapped by that fear so it's forming this habit of confession that cultivates in our hearts a keen awareness that we need something more than ourselves in order to change the way that fear dominates our lives. Quit thinking you can talk yourself out of being afraid. It doesn't work. If you've ever sat awake at night in the dark with branches banging up against your house and shadows hitting your wall and noises in your closet and underneath your bed, um, you know you can't talk yourself out of it. We need something greater. This is what we confess. Part of our confession is, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And so it begins with confession. Here's the second habit that cultivates a greater love. It's commission. We are commissioned, but I want you to see this word in two parts. There's the word mission, and then the prefix, com. Um, it's a Latin version of the Spanish word cone, right? If you go to the grocery store and you get Hormel chili in a can, it will say chili con carne, right? What's that mean? Chili with meat. So the cone is with, it's the preposition in there. And in this word commission, there's a preposition, C-O-M. It's, it's with, there's a preposition. It's not our mission. It's we are with God in his mission. You see, if you're gathered like a chick under the wings of, uh, of our good father, then where he goes, we go. Where that hen moves, we move. Where she leads, we follow. It's, it, it's the father's mission, but we become part of it. Participation in the life of God. This is what commission means. And we need this in our life if we're gonna cultivate greater love because, uh, because this is what gives us purpose. And when we follow Christ, what we'll learn to do is to love where he loves, to love the people he loves, to love the things that he loves and to see creation the way that he sees creation. We need a great recommissioning, I think, of the church. Um, because this is where uh, love begins to see its effect in the world. It's part of what we do. It's our going. Um, and, and this is part of who we are. And, and it motivates us. It compels us. And notice how this works. Like a chick gathered around her mother. It's first love for the mother that leads the chicks to go where the mother goes. 
but then it's love that becomes contagious. So when Christ leads us, it's not that we love going where we're going necessarily, but it's that we love following Christ. And when we follow him, what we find, out, what we find ourselves doing is loving the things that Christ loves. So, uh, so we've, got, uh, we've got the habit of confession, we've got the habit of commission, and then finally this, we've got the habit of compassion. And just like the word commission, there's two parts to this word. The word passion, in the Latin, you know what that means? Suffering. You remember Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ? He, it wasn't a story of a good time that Jesus had. It was a very different story. Passion means suffering. And, and compassion has the same preposition. It's with someone in their suffering. Uh, this is part of a habit of love. If you cannot walk with people when they're hurting, you shouldn't walk with them when they're not. When it's easy. And this is what, the lo- this is what greater love looks like. Uh, this is what God's love for us looks like. It is our suffering, our passion, that then he walks with all the way to the cross. It's what our ministry looks like because it's what his looks like. And it cultivates something in us. This is why, uh, this is what Jesus' story teaches us. Jesus recognized how helpless we were to face down the foxes of our lives. Helpless like chicks in a fox's den. So God became like us, vulnerable and weak, uh, compassionate so that we would recognize him and run to him like a chick runs to her mother. He looked like us so that we would see him and in seeing him, we would become what he wants for us to be. As Irenaeus, the great saint once said, God became like us so that we might become like him, like God. You see, it's about running under the protection of his wings. It doesn't mean that trials won't come. It doesn't mean that bad things won't happen, but it does mean that the sting of the worst that the foxes can do to us is taken by Christ himself. Let me finish this by telling a story that's not mine, but I've heard for decades in the church and in pulpits. I couldn't find the original source, so I will retell it as best as I can, but it's a story of a farmer who had on his acreage had a wildfire, and the fire came, swept across all of his pasture, took out all of the grazing fields, took out all of the, the bales of hay that were there for food and fodder, and, and as, as well as, uh, you know, all of, the, all of the things that they needed came up, took out all of the outbuildings, all of the barns, all the, everything was destroyed in this fire. And the farmer, the day after the fire, began the cleanup process. And he goes out, and he takes a wheelbarrow, And he's going to one of the barns where apparently his hens roosted at night. And he says, and I was picking up charred carcass after charred carcass and putting them into the wheelbarrow. And he said, and I came to this one hen and her body was burnt and deformed like all of the others, but her wings were just a little extended. The others weren't quite like that. Her wings were extended just a little bit. And, and while the feathers were, were all but gone, he could still see those wings out. And when he picked up the charred remains of that hen, five perfectly yellow chicks came out from underneath. When that fire came, that hen knew it had one job, to protect her own with her wings. This is the story of Christ. This is what greater love looks like. It's sacrificial. Did Jesus know he was a hen going into the fox's den? He knew. He knew the cost of it. He knew what it would cost him, but he knew with that cost came our life, a new life altogether, something brand new. And this is what compassion looks like. It's suffering with and for the sake of others. This is what a greater love looks like. We are so bound by fear and foxes, by Herods and tyrants. We are so bound by uh, the what ifs and the what might be's that sometimes we forget that Christ, like a mother hen, is just saying, draw close to me. 
draw close. Doesn't mean things won't go. It doesn't mean things will uh, be smooth sailing. There might be fires. There might be foxes. There might be devastation. But come close to me, and with my life, I will protect you. This is the invitation today. Even before we take this meal, eat this meal together, the invitation is for those of us who have recognized how much Herod has controlled our lives. We have a great father who is also a mother hen who's saying, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My prayer for us today is that you would find that rest as you draw close to him.